Okay, cool. Hello. It's great to be here with you. Today, I have two great guests. On my right-hand side is Zach Jackson, who is no one less than the inventor of Webpack. And to my left-hand side, we have Giorgio Boa, who is also a great uh, community member, and he is also doing a lot of stuff with Marshall Federation. So we will start today with Zach. And then you have the chance, the unique chance to directly ask him some questions. And then we will go on with additional stuff. Uh, all together, we will show you a possible future of where Marshall Federation is heading. Uh, just to be on the safe side, please everyone mute your microphones so that we don't get any background voices or sound or noise or something like this. Perhaps I can even do this. Okay, great. And yeah, I would say, Zach, uh, the stage is yours. I make you the host and that means you can directly start screen sharing and do your part. All right. Let me get my screen up here. Cool. Okay, so what I'm going to kind of go through is just, uh, I think we're all familiar with Federation, uh, since we're on this uh, Zoom bridge together. Um, what I'm going to kind of go through is the Next.js and server-side rendering parts um, of it. Since we, we're all kind of familiar with Federation, I'm going to kind of skip through the who, what, and the why, um, and get down to some of the meat of it. Um, we've been working on the ability for SSR for quite a while to try and like land it because I feel like that's been one of the weaker points is you get all the power in the front end, but when it comes to the server side, that's, I think historically always been the, the, the least, uh, that's always been our limiting factor. Whatever we want to do in the browser, we have to make sure it can happen SSR. Otherwise we can't leverage whatever we're trying to do. Federation came out really great with the browser, but not so strong on the server side. They are for limiting how far you can really take a universal app. So I've been trying to close that gap. And um, since I use Next, I started off doing this with Next. So I just kind of wanted to give a very quick overview to showcase um, you know, using Federation with SSR, um, the tools that we've got out there and you know, kind of what it looks like and you know, how that fits into the future. So um, first thing I'll do is I'm just going to go to this next slide that I've got here. This is kind of like the setup of an example that I've got for how my application is getting pulled in. I've got, you know, like, let's say a checkout application here. Uh, inside of there, I've got a navigation that comes from a different remote. I have another remote that's in another repo that deploys like a hello title or something like that. And I have the home page which incorporates it. So we have a nice view of nested remotes. Checkout pulls in nav and home. Home pulls in a third component. And you know, they all kind of are represented like that. Um, another breakdown would be, you know, this is kind of what our aspect looks like. So I want each one of these colors to be independently deployable. And I want to be able to consume them in any order without hydration issues or anything like that. So what this gets us down into is I actually have a small video here where I just do a I do a deploy of it. Ah, wrong screen. <laughs> See if I could just play it manually from here. So inside of here, I'm just going to run a commit, publish it, change some piece of text inside of my my green uh my green box that showed up in that other slide. And the idea here is I want to be able to hot reload production servers when a remote gets updated. Similar like in the browser, when you refresh the browser, you see the updated module. I don't want the server to get stuck. So end to end, this whole deploy flow takes about 60 seconds to happen. And now if I refresh the page again, you'll see the update come in inside of the server. And, you know, my load time only takes about 700 milliseconds to do a fully loaded um, 
you know, server render. And if I go and look in my HTML, you'll see like it actually shows up in the HTML there. And so that's just like a very brief kind of overview of um, being able to SSR something. Uh, why I think this is really cool is it solves a lot of issues around like distributed deployments and computing while still dealing with the fact of I still need things like hydration or data or other type of problems like that that usually um, end up causing complexities. Let's put it that way. Um, when I try to server render any of my apps, if I get Federation to work, there's still the problem of what do we do with the data? And I think that this is even not even um, necessarily server-side rendering specific, but it does show up a lot more there where you can't access something like, I say, a window object or a data store that's available at runtime. So some of the, you know, very briefly, kind of how I try to deal with that is through this concept of component-level ownership, which is smart components, co-location, keeping them loosely coupled, and good ownership boundaries. And really what this is, is kind of what, you know, myself and Manfred and, and Luca have been saying in the community quite often is, um, you know, how to design a good micro front end, whether um, you're using federation or not federation, I still try to stick to those old practices of good isolation um, boundaries between everything. So when I do a federated application with SSR or with anything else, I follow a similar kind of concept. So this is what a product page could look like currently. You'd have your attributes, you would pass a, a bunch of props into it. The problem with doing this is it becomes more brittle. Now, if I change how my flags work and say I change how purchase attributes consumes these flags, then this could end up breaking on us. So what I want to try to do is I want to try and make these components more intelligent. And with something like, say, uh, React 18 and Suspense, it's a lot easier to do this. So my federated modules, and I would say just modules in general, I want them to be more like standard micro front ends were before federation and all of this came out, where, you know, you'd have a bunch of divs and you would mount separate apps onto DOM nodes. I want my JSX to behave like that even though it's still a single render tree. I, 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 I want it to do everything that it needs to do autonomously. So, you know, this is kind of what my after would look like. You know, I would pass the minimum things. What's the color that was selected and what's the product ID? Let purchase attributes fetch all of its own data, do everything that it needs to do on its own. And now when I'm server rendering it or pulling it in, in the front end or wherever else, it's kind of shielded from any potential data changes that your consumer or, or host would have to update that could possibly break your remote if they're not updated at the same time. And, you know, what would it look like? Very simple one. I was using an older hook back then, but now I could use like a suspense hook. But the whole idea is really that I just export default, the data utility combined with the original component as something that just uses them both together and ships it out. I still expose the utility and the dumb component in case you need to do something like compose it in a specific way. But the idea is you try to create something a bit more self-contained. The last thing that I really touch on here is when I expose things, I'll usually expose them in a module proxy. The reason here is if I do need to create some backward compatible change, I don't want to have to implement it directly on my feature like purchase attributes. I prefer to implement it inside of another file where I can kind of track and unit test the contract separately from the feature that I'm exposing for others to consume. So creating a separate file that just imports and re-exports it and that be your federated module provides a nice safeguarded way to separate your feature from the exported out feature that is available at runtime. Um, and yeah, you know, that's really uh, the main thing that I wanted to cover here is like on the SSR side of things. I do have um, a slightly updated variant of this up and running in my browser uh, where I've started to play with a single app shell concept here. So this app shell has no pages or anything attached to it. It's pretty much just 
federated imports and nothing else. And if I refresh this page here, you'll see it pulls everything in. See what my timing looks like here. 700 milliseconds to fully load the whole site. The header comes from a different remote. The entire page that you're looking at comes from a different remote. This comes from a different remote. Everything comes from a separate remote, but I could still navigate through the application and it can behave very similar to a normal single page app. And so this is crossing, I believe, four separate de Next.js deployed application boundaries. Um, if you do want any of this stuff, you can find it at js-mf. Next.js-mf is the repo. It's no longer just for Next.js, but I haven't renamed it yet. Um, but this is an X workspace that includes Module Federation Next MF, Module Federation Node, Federation TypeScript, and Federation Utilities. And these are all independently released packages. If you just want SSR without Next.js, you could just use Federation Node, and that's what it's built for. And Federation Node is actually what powers the Next.js Federation under the hood for SSR. So anything you want for SSR, you can stop by here and uh, test it out. And um, yeah. That's all I really wanted to come and show off is we got SSR working and it works nice and smooth. No hydration issues. Awesome. Awesome. Big thanks to Zach. So I would say let's start with the first Q&A round uh, about this brand new feature. I know it because I tried it out in the past. Doing federation in the backhand was always very difficult, but now we have uh, official way of doing things. So I'm really happy for this. Who has questions? Feel free to ask them via audio and video or just type them into the chat. Okay, no questions, awesome. So perhaps you've seen it. Yeah, there, there, there's a question, a good one from Stefan, as always, I guess. Maybe I did not quite get the issue, but why was SSR and module federation not really compatible? Um, okay, yeah. So it, it it's not really a case of, I would say it's it was always possible to do it. What we were limited by was the underlying technology. So Node.js has no way to pull federated code in a way that a browser would do it. So you can't like, if you don't want to use this plugin and you want to make federation and SSR work, you could do it if you had a, a linked file system. Cause I could always just say my remote is dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, slash shared file system or Kubernetes, you know, stored volume slash the remote and Webpack would traverse the tree and find it but we were limited to file system bindings only. And so that's kind of a problem because most of our code bases, like if you're in Lambda on AWS, most of your code bases are not gonna have some kind of linked file system available. If you do, cause like at Lulu, what we're busy looking at is using, um, instead of like uh, S3 and HTTP to pull the code down, we're looking to optimize this plugin implementation. So I will release something in the future that'll enable elastic file system uh, directives, which basically means that I can mount uh, a, a file system onto my Lambda that's super fast to read from and a bit more secure. So I would still want, I'm still gonna try and utilize the file system, but the problem still comes down to an issue with, with Node itself. So one is how do I load code that might be over HTTP or not on disk for certain architectures? Node didn't know how to do it, so we had to write a special Webpack target that teaches Webpack how to load code in ways that Node doesn't natively support. The second problem is, is even if I use code loading mechanisms that Node understands natively, like shared volume, once you've required the code, it will not be required again. So just like in the browser, if I dynamic import something in a loop, you don't see me read dynamic import it 100 times, it'll see it already fetched the chunk, It'll never fetch it again until you refresh the page. What happens when you redeploy the remote and now the remote's been updated, you could just refresh your browser, but the server has no concept of refreshing. So the server gets stuck thinking it always has the chunks that 
you know, that are in memory, and it doesn't realize that it needs to download the chunk again. So, you know, half of this was how do we open up more transport layers to pull chunks into a server? And the other half of the challenge was how do we let the server know that chunks were updated and tell the and tell Webpack to download the updated chunks again without having to kill the server and do a rolling restart or expire the lambdas or, you know, how can we just re-invoke the machine and see the updated code. So those are the two main things. We need to be able to hot reload it and we need more flexible ways to load so code similar to how we have in browser. Awesome, awesome. Thank you for this. The next question is, can you use the same module proxy trick with non-SSR? Yeah, absolutely. So that's the, the component level ownership side of things is more a... Um, is more just a design pattern that I utilize for good micro front end design. I want the micro front end to not require a lot of complex data from the host. Um, I want to be able to independently test backward compatibility of the micro front end implementation separate from the feature itself. Because uh, I don't know if you, if any of you have worked with a complex feature, trying to maintain backward compatibility in the complex feature makes it messy. So I'd prefer to say, keep the feature as up to date as you want and just ensure that that wrapping layer, make sure that whatever it needs to do, it continues to do based on the contract that your users have agreed upon using. So the module proxy is something I use for everything, client side, server side, whatever it is, it's a great pattern because you could put even, you know, maybe like a light validator, almost like prop type checking. Hey, you sent this an array and it now it expects an object, return null, don't, throw a render error or you could do something simple like expose that module wrapped in an error boundary so now if something breaks at least what you're exposing is encapsulated in an error boundary with special loggers saying that the federated module didn't work which would be more helpful than instead of your application where you consume the federated module getting the same error boundary so it just creates the slight deviation from it uh, a way that i do it is i actually create a federated folder and i have my webpack plugin only expose modules that are inside the federated folder. So you never touch my plugin directly. Instead, like Next.js, you have pages and you have federated. And whatever's in the federated folder is automatically exposed. And that creates a good separation where everybody always has to create a another import-export file because nobody's going to write a whole code base in the, in the federated folder. <laughs> Webpack a lot. Isn't Webpack dead? <laughs> yeah, funny. Um, I would say no, it is not dead. I would say with Turbo Pack coming out, there's definitely um, some steep competition. But until such a point where, like, I would say even with the guys on this call, we've pretty much taken Federation and been able to expand it beyond Webpack, which is great. There are still some areas where Webpack just has that API that lets us do some things that these other bundlers have been challenging to do. Uh, I know Manfred, like we had a, a, quite a few discussions around the tricks of getting ES build to work. Um, and, you know, what it came down to was the same observation that I'd had. I just never thought of solving it the way that you did, which was the build tool doesn't have enough power to do exactly what we need, but we can do something in the browser runtime with a shim to work around it, which is kind of, if you think of it, it's similar to a Webpack runtime. Well, if the tool, if the machine doesn't do it, we can use something in runtime that follows some schema or format to correct the issue, regardless of if the build tool does it or not, the shims allow us to do it. So, you know, I would say the same thing still applies somewhat in the Webpack space is it still has the strongest API out there, but with Turbo Pack on the way, I am very hopeful that we'll see a Webpack competitor that has the same strength of API as Webpack, but not as slow. But, you know, we're, we still need to see what happens. We're still several months away for seeing what that shakes out to be. The good news, though, is... Um, Turbo Pack internally has been designed with module factories, so adding Federation to Turbo Pack will be possible. So yay. <laughs> cool. 
Cool, cool. That's that's a good outlook. So another question is, can you use the SSR solution with multiple frameworks? Um, I'm not entirely sure. Theoretically, yes, but it would require some some work to figure out a way to do it. So there's actually someone in the chat here called Bruno. Bruno actually works with me on consulting for Federation and everything. And so Bruno has actually been working on the whole Federation and SSR of, of um, federating in multiple versions of React and looking at the SSR potentials for that as well. So it is theoretically possible. It's just a little trickier because you, it would depend on what's the main renderer doing. Because if you're doing it in, say, React 16, how would I asynchronously stop React 16 and say, go and say, render something in view? Or I don't know how Angular's SSR works at all, but same kind of concept. I could make something print out HTML, but it would depend on whatever the, the layout engine is that's doing the main render to be able to suspend you know like if i could do it in suspense i could say say cool suspense dangerously set enter html go await whatever other sub render to happen and print it back so theoretically yeah you could do it but what we need to build out is adapter modules to handle that async scenario to switch between it in the browser we already have this like bruno kind of already built this out which is the ability to use an adapter to say React 18, use React 16 here, or React 16, render something in React 18 and send the hooks and the props back up through the older version of the, of the host. But applying that on the server side is a little trickier. Cool, cool. Um, there was another question. Is there a chance that Angular has module federation built in natively? Perhaps I may answer this question yeah, because Manfred, I, I you know go the for that one. <laughs> team quite well. And as far as I see it, it does not have any priority. Uh, the whole micro front end story does not seem to have any priority. And the reason is not everyone needs it. Most people doing Angular won't need Federation. I think federation is something for a special kind of application. It's a niche. And so I think the Angular team will leave this to other vendors, people in the community like us implementing plugins, uh, people like the NX people that also baked <laughs> in module federation directly into NX. This is my current impression. But actually, why would you say Angular doesn't say federation of these are all like more web concepts, right? So why would you say Angular doesn't need a module federation? Because you could still have the micro front ends in Angular, right? Are you saying there's limitation in Angular, micro front ends? Mm, so there is no technical limitation. On a technical level, you can do everything you can also do with other frameworks. However, um, federation is always about runtime integration. That means you load something at runtime you did not know at compile time. And Angular, on the other side, has this whole idea of doing as much as possible at compile time in order to ensure a good performance and in order to ensure that everything works seamlessly together. So it's it's a bit a clash of concepts. And I think they also want to prevent that people use it without needing it, and then they might run into issues with runtime integration. If you ask me, runtime integration always should be a decision you really do directly. Nothing that happens by incident, a decision you do on purpose. And then it might be fine if you know about the consequences, the positive ones, and the pitfalls up front. Yeah, I'd say another thing, like maybe, or like a practice that we follow on the Webpack side of things is like, if it doesn't need to be in the core, it shouldn't be in the core. So unless we have to directly change base classes of the framework, and there's no way to ship this through hooks or through plugins or through outer ecosystem, then we'll introduce it into the core. Otherwise, we, you know, we'll do everything not to. So um, does the framework 
is is the implementation of federation drastically limited by not being baked into the framework as first class? If not, then I never see a reason why it needs to be baked in. I'd prefer that extra flexibility. The core team doesn't have to manage as many challenges or as many issues. The niche people who focus on it specifically can help control and drive that area a little bit better versus losing the control and having it wired into a framework where it becomes very opinionated on how it works one specific way, or that's usually how we end up seeing the scenario shake out. Um, and also now changing anything becomes a much higher risk because it's part of this core thing that's used everywhere. So any tweak could have very large impacts across the board. So I don't know, that's always been my personal preference. Don't make it incompatible, but it doesn't, all, it doesn't have to be baked in from the start. <laughs> Actually, I have a question for Jack, this kind of different question. So let's say React is a TypeScript and Angular by default TypeScript. That's, even Vue can return it to the TypeScript. Is there a way like they can all, I don't know, more compatible in terms of this uh, framework slash library? Because I I used to work in Angular, now I work heavily in React. I did a little bit of Vue, but at some point, is there any convergence or are they always like, because we are borrowing the concepts, right? React and Angular, vice versa, they're borrowing the concepts. So. Is it feasible? Like I, I was just thinking out loud, you know. Um, uh, I would say probably the best hope for that would be something like Quick or Mitosis from Builder.io, where they're trying to make a, I guess, I don't know, a framework, a framework. But the idea would be you could write something in any language, and it doesn't matter, and it all gets kind of transfer transpiled into a single rendering layer. So you can have something in React, something in Vue, but you're not going to download React and Vue in order to use mitosis. But mitosis could interpret any of them. I'm not entirely sure how it does it, but you know that's kind of what I I would see as a potential to it. I think the frameworks in general probably will continue to converge, but with this big kind of you know thing around Astro Build or you know React server components or or you know quick JS and resumability and stuff like that. I could see like a bigger part of the market share trying to find out well how do we solve the fragmentation issue with something that can sit on top of it and say write it in whatever you want and we're going to convert it back into the basics of just it's HTML with some watcher events that fire off JavaScript side effects rather than everything that there is. But yeah. I think you're not talking about web, web assembly, right? Web, web assembly that makes even JavaScript stale because you can write any language and then compiles to whatever. Uh, there's also some push around the web assembly. Yeah, there's there's some interesting things in, in the WASM space. Um, I'd still like to see it show up in a more realistic like world use case. Um, I don't know. I think like WASM could be great. I just would love a better DOM implementation or something like that, like to offer us like a full way to like render the DOM tree without the JavaScript binding layer. And I know that there's some things out there that kind of do that, but I don't know. Uh, there's definitely a lot of potential there, but we'll see. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I want to say that my dosis under the hood, read uh, JSX light uh, language, and with uh, Babel, produce uh, uh, JSON with uh, a lot of uh, options. And with this option, mitosis uh, create uh, view, uh, react, uh, whatever files to work with many frameworks. So uh, from the original JSX with uh, the uh, all the options like uh, uh, how to use uh, the um, state when the life cycle of the component uh, start and whatever produce a lot of files for all these frameworks. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Are there any other questions? Take your chance.
Oh, yeah, there was another question from Bruno. Zach, on a recent LinkedIn post you shared about publishing to CDN. Can you talk more about chunk caching with SSR and how we can distribute federated modules on CDNs and how this impact on server-side rendering time? How this impacts on server-side rendering time? So there's a few posts that I've done around the CDN. One of them is like Federation at the Edge. Um, this is a new concept that I'm working on in, in Webpack called uh, Delegate Modules. And the idea is, since I, I have two ways of doing Federation on the Edge. One is I compile with WebAssembly a different JavaScript engine that allows me to perform code generation, and I deploy a different JS engine to Cloudflare, and my code gets interpreted in a custom engine. The other option is I use a delegate module where, um, where instead of uh, you passing like promise new promise or the at syntax uh, to the federation plugin, you could pass a pointer reference to say, hey, use this internal file inside of Webpack to do the delegation of loading the remote. And inside of those scenarios, what I could do is I could say, when you try to import header, my delicate module could see you're deployed into the you're deployed into the edge network, so you can't pull in a code and evaluate the header. Instead, what I could do is I could change what the get and init API does. So what you import is module exports an async thing that returns an HTML string. So when I import header, what I actually get is module exports this the the text of header that a different edge network rendered header and responded with. So it's like I'm require instead of using fetch to stitch it all together, you could use Webpack as a stitching layer itself, where what you're doing is importing markup that's only good for a single edge hit or a single edge render. So that's one way for um, that's one way to to like do it. And there's other reasons for delegate modules that I've done as well. Like um, uh, I need to hit an API to figure something out, or I need to check their JSON web token and determine A, B, and C, or you know I want to hook up Federation to launch darkly. Well, I could do that with a delegate module because I could use require and import in there, and all I have to do is say module exports promise, and then whatever the Git and init interface is to the remote entry. But I could also send a fake remote entry back and say, well, Git is fetch then res text then you know return react component with dangerously set owner html and now i'm doing multi-server rendering but all the developer knows is that they import header and it returns something or you know you could uh do something with babel and say get all the props that they send it similar to server components read all the props and make a query param and send those over the network the uh the the um the other thing uh, with CDN would probably be the caching side of it, which would be how do you cache bust these things? Usually what I'll do is either stale while revalidate if I can, or um, or some kind of like a timestamp when I inject the remote, or I'll use something like Medusa where I hash the remote and I report the build data to something like Medusa and Medusa can create a unique hash for it. So that way I could query something and say, hey, I'm in this environment, I'm looking for this remote and I'm this host, what remote entry should I get? And Medusa could reply and say, it's this remote with this unique name and you never know what the name of the remote is, you just know how you call it. And Medusa generates a magical name that won't collide and a unique hash for the remote entry itself. And that keeps them all versioned and distributed and things like that. Awesome. I also see a lot of compliments for the way you are answering the questions that you are taking freestyle questions. Uh, and yeah, also a bit more of compliments. So awesome. <laughs> yeah. Are there, are there any further questions? Last round, you know, like in an English pub, there is this bell, bing, 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 <laughs> last round. So actually, Jack, uh, since you're talking about a lot of, I know this webpack, I know you, you were part why is Webpack so complex? Because right now we use four. Unfortunately, we're stuck with the four. We couldn't migrate to Webpack five. I know Turbo Pack is came, but Turbo Pack I'm not really because it just came out from Next.js. I mean, I'm not that party. I don't work from Vercel. 
why is we not making some simpler right okay we are getting some more of this and that but another day i mean you make it simpler right because no matter what you how much you watch next uh, year's presentations it sounds good but i don't think anybody is working on making it simpler right like uh, um you know uh yeah uh i would say this is the trade off that i've seen like i agree setting up a a build i mean i don't know i've seen this in a lot of things like configuring webpack versus configuring roll up it's like okay yeah roll up saves me like 10 minutes but it's only 10 minutes i can understand but i also work with webpack a lot so i can understand like it's probably a little bit more tricky but i think in general the problem that i've seen which i'm hoping i think like in webpack 6 it'll probably get a bit better because webpack's done things like included asset modules for file loader or stuff like that and they're going to be incorporating many css into some version of webpack 5 like there's an experiment you could enable already so they're trying to make the tools more out the box somewhat able to run the problem with doing that to some degree has been you end up getting a tool that's very good and very fast at one job but it can't do anything else and that's the i don't know that's kind of the where the pitfall of of a lot of build tools have fallen into it's uh the simpler it is the faster it is the less it can actually end up doing so you have to work with it only the way that it's supposed to be worked with but on the flip side it's also a compiler so configuring a compiler is you know inherently a lower level task so trying to strike a good balance of here's something that's easy to just pick up and use, but also something that's not going to, you're not going to run out of runway and, you know, five years time, you could still keep on extending it and extending it. That's the big challenge. And I think that's the, that's, that's the tough part, even with turbo pack, whenever it comes out, I'm very interested to see what's its API going to actually look like for developers to extend, but also for plugin authors to write and create on because you know, like it's just, it's very tricky to, to find that balance. The, the easier you make it, the less it can do, the more complex you make it, the more powerful it is, the better it is for like really big enterprise. But we've also seen that trade off, especially with Webpack of the more it can do, the slower it becomes but it's also written in javascript and is bottlenecked by node and other kind of things and it's you know been around for several years so something written in rust will probably be a lot quicker but what will the api look like will we still have a js sdk so that we could write a plugin easily or do we have to write everything in rust or like um you know with s uh with ES build, you could write them in Go or you could write them in JS. Like that would be a good API to have where you still have a decent amount of power out of it. But I mean, compilers are just hard. Let me put it that way. <laughs> like either way you go, if you want something extendable, it's it's going to be, it, you know, it's going to have more surface area. I would like more presets though, like using React. Yes. One to SSR. Yes. Cool. And it just build, you know, something in general a little bit more you know, prefabricated where it configures like 10 things for you versus it just builds JS. So I don't know. Hopefully we'll see more presets come out at least. Cool. Thanks for this. And there's a last question about the SSR solution. Perhaps I missed this, but I all your federated components being pulled from a separate repo or are they from a mono repo? they're all separate repos i do poly repo polyliths that's what i refer to them as so my type of architecture is a polylith so the, the idea is it runs like a monolith during execution but it's actually multiple monoliths that can be reproduced and reconfigured everywhere um so for my polylithic design that's the concept of it my biggest bottleneck in micro front ends is deploy autonomy and rate of change to the code bases themselves. I'm in retail, so I have a mix of risk profiles I have to cater for. I have checkout. If checkout breaks, the CEO is on the Sev1 <laughs> call. 
So checkout is super rigorous to get anything done in. Checkout historically has had the account stuff in it because that's where a lot of auth and things like that were useful. Account can't move super quickly if they're with checkout because any deploy could impact checkout stability. So things have to move very carefully in there. So for me, I want more repos where whatever your risk is, that's fine. Move at your own pace. It doesn't inconvenience anybody else. And if we need to update something in there through Federation, we also have the ability to pin you to an older version of it, similar to NPM. I could say, go into S3 bucket and get this commit hash and check out, use that commit hash. Whoever's not as risk averse, you can just pin to latest or upgrade whenever you want, but we don't have to redeploy your application to get new code in. If we need a mandate that this is deprecated, we can click a button and the entire company will switch to the next nearest version available that's not deprecated. So it offers us a lot more orchestration, but I still want the stability of lock file like behavior. That's mostly why I use Federation with Medusa to give me that kind of combination. Um, but there, there are also cases where SSR works very nicely together uh, with monorepo. I would say a big one is say in the NX space. You've got NX caching. If if your if your limit is not policy or standards on how code is contributed on a repo by repo basis, then I would say probably something like NX would work well. It helps enforce everything. You've got generators, you've got policies, you've got all the kind of bells and whistles that you want. You've got the caching, so you can only re-release the pieces that need to be released. So it depends on your org structure and how they need to work. But for me, we already have a lot of PRs going into a single repo. You know, I mean, some of our, some of, one of our repos is on PR number 8,000 at the moment. That's just one of them. And, and we have 55 applications. Imagine all 55 applications in one pull, in like one Git repo, just the sheer size of it and the install time. And it's, it's just too big. Let's put it that way. There's, there's too much in too many places. And we don't necessarily want everybody to be able to touch everything. Or what if somebody deletes a lock file and suddenly something stops behaving the way it was before. And there's just risk profiles that we try to mitigate through blast radius and separation of concerns. But inside of my sub app setup that I have, we architecture we have had for a while is we have a bunch of mini mono repos. So check out each page would be a workspace. You'd have the account, you'd have the bag, you'd have the whatever. And it's inside of a miniature mono repo that builds one next app and just publishes it up. And that's worked decently well for just sharing little tools and utilities that need to be shared amongst each other. But generally I try to keep it set up as multi-repo based on the deployable parts because that's just what works for me. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, so thanks Zach for sharing your current work and a part of the future of Webpack today. This is really amazing, especially because more and more frameworks are coming up with a very sound SSR, hydration, resumability story. So I think this is really important nowadays. Yeah, okay. thank you for having me. <laughs> with the greatest pleasure. Okay, let's move on with the second part of today. For this part, I have prepared something. I call it import maps, which might be the next evolution step for micro frontends. Might be. And for this, I want to start with a metaphor. I'm pretty sure you know something like this. A good old mechanical typewriter. A mechanical one. My mom had one. I remember it. When I was in kindergarten, my mom showed it to me and I was really impressed. I really loved it. All those keys I could play around with. I could print letters on the sheets of paper. And there was even this ribbon I could change in order to switch over from black to red fonts. So I was really amazed. And I also think I destroyed it back then when I was in kindergarten somehow. But anyway. When we look at this typewriter, we see this here, a good old QWERTY layout. 
And the thing is, I looked it up for this presentation. The QWERTY layout has been around for about 150 years. There are better layouts. Meanwhile, we know there have been studies. There are better layouts, but still we are sticking with the QWERTY layout because somehow we are locked in, aren't we? It would be too exhausting to move over the whole industry to another layout, to make all the people learn to type with another layout. Learning to type is nothing that happens in some minutes. You need a lot of practice for this. However, a good thing to prevent lock-ins, for instance, vendor lock-ins in the area of software development is using micro frontends and also, of course, microservices in the backend. Because those ideas are about subdividing a huge application into tiny parts. Tiny parts that can be developed by different teams, tiny parts that can use different technology stacks. That means after some years, if you implement a new part, you can use the newest, the greatest, and the latest stuff. Of course, you don't do this for fun. You don't want to have a framework zoo, but sometimes it's necessary. We all know technologies are coming and going. And somehow, if we talk about business software, enterprise scale software, we have a piece of software that needs to be maintained for quite a long term. And so we need to switch out the technology on the go, or we need to at least bring in new pieces of technology on the go after five, seven, or 10 years. And this is quite easy with such a concept, with such an architecture. However, Nothing comes for free in this ugly world. Uh, if we go with micro frontends, we also go with runtime integration. That means at runtime, we need to integrate all those moving parts into a common hall, into something I would call a shell, an application shell, for instance. We really need to do this at runtime because at compile time, we don't know this stuff. Everything is separately built, compiled, and published. So we only know it at runtime. And runtime integration is really something that is everything but not easy. For quite a long time, there was no good solution for runtime integration. And that's why I was quite happy when Webpack uh, shipped module federation. Because module federation is really a game changer here. It makes it drop death easy to load something from over there, from a separately compiled and deployed application. You might call it a micro frontend. It's really just a matter of an import statement, of a dynamic import statement, and you know, pops your uncle. However, even though I'm an early adopter of module federation, and also an advocate for it, it comes with one drawback. Namely, currently, it is locked into Webpack. And this is somehow funny, because the best option we currently have to prevent a vendor login comes with a vendor login. It is locked into Webpack. And so the big question I want to answer is, how can we make this Mandel model of module federation, this really smart Mandel model, SEC came up with several years ago, available on other platforms, for other frameworks, and especially for other bundlers? Perhaps you've seen it. There is a new bundler now that is called TurboPack. It's currently developed. It's in very early stages. And there are other bundlers that become more famous, like ES Build or WIT. They are quite fast. They are all written with native technologies. And so they are really fast. And sometimes they are easier to use with all the trade of SAC Delta told us about before. But somehow we don't want to re implement module federation time and again for each and every bundler that is here or that will show up eventually. And so the question is how can we bring this very smart Mandel model of module federation to other platforms in an easy way? 
how can we re-implement Marshall Federation in a way that is very, very portable? And for this, I want to show you a browser native approach, an approach that is using as much browser native technologies as possible. The good thing about browser native stuff is browser native stuff is here to stay. If someone lands in the browser, if someone is implemented by the majority of the browsers out there, it will be there for quite a long time. It will stay almost forever because breaking the web is nothing browser vendors want to do. For my approach, I'm going here with ECMAScript modules, which have been around for quite a long time. And I'm going with import maps which is a newer idea for a browser native approach for loading ECMAScript modules, for resolving ECMAScript modules directly in your browser. The contents I have prepared for you is, I want to start with import maps in general. I want to show you what import maps are about, for which use cases they have been envisioned, and what they are capable to do. And in the second part, I want to tell you, in the second, not in the third part, I'm sorry, in the second part, I want to tell you how we can use import maps together with ECMAScript modules to re-implement module federation, to re-implement the smart idea of module federation in a framework and tooling agnostic way. Before we start, let me also introduce myself. I am Manfred. I am a trainer and consultant for Angular, and I'm focusing on Angular for enterprise scale applications. I'm doing a lot of trainings and consultancy in this area. I'm also quite connected to the Angular community. I live in Austria. I do a lot of stuff in Germany. Normally, I'm every second week in Germany and do consultancy and workshops there. And of course, I'm always happy to work together with people around the globe. Nowadays, this is quite easy because we are used to remote technologies now. For some reason, I don't know why, for about two years or a bit more, we are really used to go with remote technologies. Okay, let's get started with the first thing I've prepared for you. It's about import maps. So perhaps you've seen those. ECMAScript modules. They have been around for quite a long time. They have been introduced with ECMAScript 2015. The thing is, normally, you don't use ECMAScript modules in your browser. Normally, you resolve those modules, those import statements during build time. Your bundler is normally responsible for it. And for this, the bundler is emitting some special code that loads the other packages on demand, or perhaps the bundler is just inlining the other bundle in your bundle. But now with import maps, we can resolve those import statements directly in your browser. And for this, they define a simple data structure, a map as the name suggests, a map that is just mapping those beautiful names you use in your import statements to the name of the files you want to import. Here, for instance, I'm mapping the name date functions to a pre-compiled version of date functions JS. Also, we can point to other applications. We can say, well, this name here is long weekend, for instance, is resolved by grabbing this module over there on this server. And this other module is bridging day is resolved by grabbing another module from another server. This has nothing to do, of course, with micro frontends, but if we think twice, if we look at this, we can find out this can be used to load a micro front end at runtime. This can be used to load something at runtime that comes from a different origin that has been separately compiled and deployed. We just can point over there. And this is something module federation is also doing. There is another nice thing when it comes to import maps. There is a thing called scopes. 
with scopes you can define that every time this guy here, that app module is requesting date functions, it will get this version of date functions. And every time, for instance, another guy is requesting date functions, he or she or it is getting that version of date functions. That means you can resolve version conflicts. You can assure that each and every moving part of your system gets the versions they need. And this is also something module federation is doing. This is one of the strategies for dealing with version mismatches. Another thing that is quite nice is you can totally write your import maps dynamically. You can create them dynamically in your browser. That means you could look at the metadata about this and that micro front end. You could introduce scopes. You could say, well, those two guys need different versions of date functions, but those two guys need the same version. You could write the scopes according to these facts. And then you can just add this import map to your page. The browser will pick it up and use it. And also, this allows us to re-implement further strategies for dealing with version, mis version mismatches, strategies we find in module federation today. If we look to the browser support, you might say, oh my, this does not look that well, does it? Of course, when it comes to Chromium-based browsers, uh, everything is supported. When it comes to Firefox, then we have those little green flags telling us on this page here, where I took this uh, picture, this screenshot, that it has already been implemented. It's already there, but it's not activated. You need to activate it by hand using your browser settings to get it. Of course, we cannot expect that our users will activate this feature by hand. However, it is quite a good message to know that this feature is already there because now chances are high that this will eventually be activated by default. However, when it comes to Safari, as that often, it does not look well. When it comes to Safari, there is no support at all. However, the good message is there is a battle brew and shim. This guy here, Guy Bradford, who is quite known in the JavaScript community, and everyone knows something he writes has high quality, Guy Bradford implemented a shim. And he also tested it for performance, and his conclusion is it is highly performant and production ready. To make it as fast as possible, he is using WebAssembly underneath the covers. Underneath the covers. You don't recognize it, but if you load this polyfill, it will load some logics using WebAssembly. And so we are on the safe side. So we can start using it today. And perhaps in the future, we can drop it because hopefully in the future, all the browsers will support it. Okay, let me show a demonstration for this. Uh, wrong folder. Let me just look up the right folder. Here we go. Here we have some simple examples for this. This whole example, you already saw it on the slides, is about a very serious topic. Very serious. It's about bridging days. You know, if you have a holiday on a Tuesday or a Thursday, then you just need to take one other holiday and you have a quite long weekend. And if the holiday is on Monday or Friday, then at least in this case, you have a longer weekend with three days. This is what I'm checking here for. Let's get started with a simple example. Here I have my script. Everything directly runs in the browser. I am importing from date functions. I need format and pass ISO date. And then I'm just getting out the weekday of this date. And you see it here, if it is a Monday or a Friday, I say at least it's a long weekend. 
if it is a Tuesday or a first day, I'm saying, hey, hooray, it's a bridging day. So in order to resolve this name here, I have an import map here that points date functions or map state functions to this file here on a CDN. Obviously, when we talk about enterprise scale applications, we want to be dependent on a CDN when it comes to critical source code. And that's why in the second example, I'm just pointing over to a pre-compiled version of date functions. Of course, it is compiled in a version that still provides ECMAScript modules. In this case here, I'm just uh, putting some logic into other files. I have this is long weekend function I put into this file. And I have this is bridging day function I put into that file. Of course, per se, this is not a micro front end. But for this example, think about this as about a micro front end. It is something that can be separately compiled and deployed, knowing that normally a micro front end is a bit bigger and a bit more coarse grained. But yeah, here this logic is now switched out to another file that is separately loaded and hopefully before separately compiled and deployed. And because I have this mapping, I can directly load those functions into my code and use those functions. In the next evolution step here, I'm going with a scope. And this scope tells us that every time is bridging day, is needing date functions, is importing date functions, it gets this version of date functions. We could also say, well, every time the other guy here is long weekend, needs date functions, it gets this version of date functions and not the other version of date functions. This allows us to bypass version conflicts. Everyone else is getting what we have defined here. Everyone else is getting the stuff we defined above here. Oh, I just see my mic had an issue. Let me double check. Yeah, should be fine now. Okay. So this is the fallback. We can even write everything in a dynamic way. And for this, I'm here doing also something micro frontends based on module federation are doing. They are loading some metadata about this and that micro frontend. In my case, the metadata is quite simple. In my case, the metadata is just an object pointing to a possible bundle containing date functions and to its version. I'm doing this for my first micro frontend and for the second micro frontend. And then I'm writing my import map in a dynamic way. I'm saying, well, the first micro front end defines the default version of date functions. Someone needs to define the default. And the other micro front end perhaps takes the same version. It depends. It depends upon we have whether we have the same version or not. That means here I'm doing a net negotiation to find out what this very micro front end gets at runtime. And this is also something module federation needs to do. It looks at the micro front end and it defines or decides what to load for which micro front end. In my case, my negotiate function is quite easy. I'm just looking or checking if we have the same version on both sides. And if this is the case, I'm going with the first path. That means I'm reusing the path I already used up here. Otherwise, I'm going with a path of my own. Obviously, this can be done in a more, uh, in a more sophisticated way, like checking for minor and major versions, checking for batch versions, and finding out who has the highest compatible version. But I think we have enough fantasy to imagine that someone could implement a more sophisticated uh, way of doing this in here. And last but not least, 
we need to load this polyfill here to make all of this work in each and every browser. The good message here is that all of this, all of what uh, import maps are providing are the building blocks for re-implementing the smart Mandel model of module federation. Of course, those building blocks are quite low level. If you ask me, they are far too low level. They don't provide the comfort we get from something like module federation. But the building blocks are there. We just need to use them. And this brings me to the second part, which is about implementing or re-implementing the ideas behind module federation with import maps. So if you want to do this, you don't need to do much. You just need to implement some stuff and I subdivided all the tasks involved into this into three categories. The first category is about dealing with metadata. The second category is about bundling everything, bundling the micro front ends, but also bundling the shared parts so that we can decide at the runtime if we want to load this shared part from here or there. And a third category is about dealing with import maps, creating them dynamically. When it comes to dealing with metadata, we need to provide the metadata at compile time. This is also what module federation is doing with its remote entries. And we need to load it somehow at runtime, because at runtime we need to know that here we have this version and there we have that version. When it comes to bundling, as mentioned, we need to bundle the remotes. We need to separately bundle the shared packages. And we need to respect different compilers, like the Angular compiler, the Svelte compiler, and so on and so forth. And when we talk about import maps, this all is about generating the import maps using the collected metadata at runtime and about creating scopes, smart scopes, for dealing with version mismatches. So it's completely doable. We have the building block, we have the tasks here, it's completely doable. And I guess if you would try this, it would take you about two weeks. I know it quite precisely because I did it. My implementation is called SoftArc. Native Federation, SoftArc is the name of my company. There is a funny story behind it, uh, behind this name. Perhaps I tell you the story another time. And this implementation is, as you can see here in the README page, an implementation of the Mandel model of module federation. Plus, it is built in a way that works quite nicely with all the possible build tools out there. It's build tool agnostic because most of the stuff is implemented outside of the build tool. And we are embracing browser native technologies like import maps and ECMAScript modules. We have a layered architecture here. The lower layer is SoftArc Native Federation. It is quite a straightforward implementation of all those ideas. The upper layers provide some sugar, sugar that makes it easy to integrate this idea into the world of Angular. For this, we have Angular Architects Native Federation. You know, Angular is abstracting everything quite a bit. In Angular, we have the Angular CLI. We need somehow to hook into the Angular CLI in order to tell Angular to use this when compiling the application. And this is what we are doing here. This also ships with some code generators that streamlines the usage of this. And my friend, who is also a speaker today, uh, Giorgio, implemented a nice plugin for Wit. His first example was about Wit and Svelte. But meanwhile, we have also examples for Wit and React and Wit and Angular. There is a nice community contribution called Analog.js. It's from Brandon Roberts, a well-known guy in the community, uh, one of the contributors, main contributors of NshareX, and he allows it to run Angular on Wit. 
And if we add our plugin to the play, then we can use it together with Native Federation. Plus, feel free to add further high-level abstractions to integrate everything more seamlessly into your stack. Saying this, and you already saw it here, if you go with a very simple configuration, let's say vanilla JS and ES build or React and ES build, then this low level, this lower level, this lower layer is completely fine. If you have more elaborated tools like WIT, Angular tools that abstract everything a bit more, then you will very likely want to have a nice integration layer. As I'm an Angular guy, I really streamlined all of this for the usage in Angular. What you need to do is you need to npm install this Angular layer. Then you can run a code generator with ng generate blah, blah, blah in it. This generates some configuration files. This hooks into the Angular CLI. Then you need to adjust your native federation configs. Those are configurations files that are generated by the ng-generate command, by the init schematic. And then all you need to do is lazy loading. It's really as simple as lazy loading, but this is in general the case when we talk about the very smart Mandel model of module federation. I always say, if it works with lazy loading, it will also totally work with module federation. Okay, let me show you an example for this. Uh, somehow I closed my example. <laughs> Not a good idea. Localhost, yeah, here we go. And localhost, here we go to. Here we have a micro frontend. It's in between those red dashed lines. And here we have a shell. Both are separately compiled and deployed. They even run on different origins. I have different ports here, like port 3000 for the shell and port 3001 for the microphone. And no, this is not a prerequisite. You can totally deploy everything on the same origin on the same server. But showing this with different origins really proves that we are talking about separately compiled and deployed applications. And having different origins is normally what you have at least during development time. Normally you get one development web server per application. When I'm clicking here, then you see, hey, I'm seamlessly loading the micro frontend in do here. I'm really seamlessly loading. Let's have a look at our browser tab in the, or at, at our network tab in our console. When I'm loading the shell, then the source code of the shell is loaded, obviously, including all the polyfills and chunks we need. We also get some metadata. I'm using the name of module federation here, the name remote entry. However, here it is just a JSON file with all the metadata we need. This metadata tells us which micro frontend is using which library in which version. Here we see this micro frontend is using Angular animation in this version, and that micro frontend is also using Angular animation. And we are lucky because here we are going with the same version. And then all the shared bundles are loaded, each and every shared. A uh, library is a bundle of its own. And then something beautiful happens. If we want to load another micro frontend like this here, we just need to load the source code of this micro frontend, which is just about 1.5 case in this scenario. Even my Angular BNG is larger. I should have optimized it. I'm very sorry. But the main message here is we don't need to reload Angular and all the other shared libraries. They are already there. The shell already came with it and the shell will share it with us. If the version matches, if the version matches and so on. If we had a version mismatch, then we would get one of the strategies that are baked into the framework for dealing with those mismatches, like 
loading your own version or throwing an exception, stuff like this. If we look at the source code of this, we see that everything looks like with traditional webpack module federation. We have this module federation config. Each and every micro front end gets a name and we can expose files here. Those are files that we want the shell to load at runtime. And normally the shell is not interested into our paths and that's why we are assigning aliases. Also, we can define that we want to share libraries. And you know, sharing is always an opt-in. If I want you to share your desert with me, you need to agree and I need to agree. Of course, I will always agree because I'm very into deserts, but you also need to agree. So it's always an opt-in. And so I need to configure here that I want to share this or that library. Normally, I needed to list here all those libraries in an exhaustive way. But this is very error prone and a real showstopper. That's why I'm going with a trick here and learn from Zach. I have a share all helper. The share all helper looks in my package JSON and just share all, shares all the packages defined in there. It's good for getting started. And then we can optimize by telling the runtime, hey, please skip this and that library when it comes to sharing. I don't want to share Angular common testing and other stuff. Okay, this is the configuration of the micro frontend. This is everything you need to do to make a micro frontend out of your existing application. How cool is that? Of course, also the shell has a micro frontend configuration, but here normally I just say, well, let's share the same libraries. In order to tell the shell about the micro frontend at runtime, I have a manifest JSON, a federation manifest. This is not the prerequisite, but I like it to be capable of switching out the paths during deployment. Because when deploying this in debug mode, I will for sure have different URLs than when deploying it for production mode. So this is just a simple tiny configuration file. And when bootstrapping my application, I'm just loading this manifest. And then something beautiful happens. Then all you need is just lazy loading. Here I'm doing lazy loading with Angular stuff. I have my router, I have a routing configuration. I have this path here and load children points to a Lambda expression that is lazily loading this or that module from over there. And here you see, I'm going with a helper function for lazy loading, which picks up module from MFE1. So where does MFE1 come from? Well, it comes from my manifest. Here I've defined MFE1 is now found over there. Here you have the metadata. This is where, this is where MFE1 comes from. And if you are wondering, well, where does module come from? Well, module comes from the configuration file of the micro frontend where I expose this module for the shell under the Elias module. It's really as easy as that. You can even bypass this helper function. You can totally go with a dynamic import. The only drawback of a dynamic import is normally this dynamic import is compiled into your bundles. And as it is compiled into your bundles, you cannot switch it out at runtime. This might be okay-ish. However, in a highly dynamic scenario where you don't know about your micro front ends upfront, you might go with this helper function because here nothing is directly compiled into the bundle. Now we just have strings. That means you can read those strings from a metadata file. And so you can uh, define your routes in a dynamic way. 
You can define your menu items in a dynamic way, and this allows you to load stuff you did not know about at Compiler. To put it in a nutshell, for very dynamic scenarios, this helper function is your friend. If it is not totally dynamic, you can totally go with a traditional import. And that's it. Of course, there is a critical question. And I think each and every professional, after implementing something, should ask this critical question. Is it good enough? Can we use it? Or in our case, when can we use it? And the answer is, there is a good message. I've announced Native Federation 1.0 on October 10, 2022 which is a symbolic date. It is exactly, I've never talked about it. I'm talking about it for the first time here. It was exactly two years after they have been released Webpack 5 with Marshall Federation. It was kind of a coincidence. I was ready one day before, but I recognized this. And so I just waited one more day. Uh, to go with this symbolic date. So it's 1.0, it's there, and you can totally use it, at least when it comes to the lower layer. When it comes to the integration layer for Angular, we are still in beta. And the reason is a simple one. I don't want to re-implement the whole world. I'm using stuff the Angular team is currently working on. And currently, perhaps you've seen it, the Angular team is working on an ES build builder, on an ES build integration into Angular. It's still experimental. And that's why also my implementation is experimental, only beta. It might work in some circumstances, but it is more about trying out this stuff and uh, getting your fingers dirty on it. I would not use this integration AI now in production. If you need a solution now, stick with Webpack module federation. Webpack is totally fine. Webpack has several million downloads a week. It's major. It's battle tested and battle proven. It's the best option you have in the short and midterm. Get started with it. And be happy because you know if sometime you want to move over to another bundler, you can do it. When the Angular team is ready, we will be ready. And then you might reconsider moving over to Native Federation. But for now, here and now, Webpack module Federation is the best option. And as Native Federation is completely compatible, at least when it comes to your code, not on a binary level, but when it comes to the configuration files, uh, you will quite, it will be quite easy for you to move over when needed. By the way, this here is our Angular integration for a module federation, for Webpack module federation. So my recommendation is if you currently use Webpack, no need to hurry and worry, stick with it. It's a good solution. If you already use ES build or WIT, then give Native Federation a try and provide feedback. It's in version 1.0 and it should work. Once the Angular CLI moves over to ES build, we will get you covered with Native Federation. Then also Native Federation will be ready for prime time as we are mostly using the stuff the Angular CLI team is working on. And in general, Native Federation is your insurance for the mid and long term. It assures you, ensures you that you can use this smart Mandel model nowadays, but also in the future, even though we have some new and other build tools out there. By the way, we have this Angular architecture workshop. So if you like those topics, you will also like this workshop. We are answering several questions in here, questions like how to implement maintainable architectures with monorepos, standalone components, domain-driven design, and an X. 
But another question we are answering is how to implement micro frontends with module federation standalone components and or web components with one repo or several repositories. And for sure, there are a lot of other questions that are answered. We do this as a public workshop and as a company training remotely and on site in German and in English. So if you're interested, check out our page. Okay, let me come to a conclusion. What did we see today? We saw that the Mandel model of module federation really rocks. It's the best invention since sliced bread. Import maps, however, provide all the low level building blocks we need to re implement it. However, here we are talking about low level building blocks. That's why we need something above it, something like native federation that really implements everything we need in a very comfortable way, like module federation is doing. My turn on it is native federation and try it out now with ES build and wit. And once the Angular CLI team is ready for ES build, we will ready to for native federation and prime time. And one last thing, the were the vendor login. Always think about this QWERTY layout. By the way, I've already uploaded my material to my blog. And if you like, follow me on Twitter to stay in contact. Follow me on Twitter as long we have it, as long Twitter is there. Okay, cool. Are there any questions so far? Let me look up the chat. Are there any questions? I don't know, Mom, Fred, if you want uh, to show the implementation with Vit on top of Native Federation right now. And then ah, yeah, can... yeah, that's that's a good idea. And then we can answer all the questions together. That's that's a good idea. So in this case, let's keep this Q&A round. Let's combine it with the uh, last Q&A round because Giorgio is right. Giorgio has a real cool showcase for all of this. You know, my showcases are quite simple. They just show it works, but Giorgio has really something that pleases your eyes. So please, Giorgio, stage is yours. I give you all the rights you need. To yeah. The host. Stage is yours. Now you okay. are the padre in the house. Okay, now you see my screen. Okay. Yeah, as, I see it. As we okay. can see a um, few minutes ago, it's really simple to create uh, your own implementation on top uh, of native federation. So here I created with Manfred a few months ago a solution for, for VIT. So here there is a, a proof of concept with uh, Svelte, but we have also a, a proof of concept uh, with the React. So here we have uh, two applications. One is the host, this one, and one is the remote. As you can see here, we have uh, the VIT configuration. Okay. Maybe I zoom a little bit less and I can get rid of this one. Okay, perfect. So here, the VIT configuration. As you can see, we have the native federation uh, plugin. Okay, we saw before. And then in the configuration, uh, VIT uh, give us the possibility to write uh, our own plugin. So with the federation, this function here arrives straight from the VIT module federation NPM package. We can define a few options. And the most important one is the federation config file that we will see in a few minutes. And then we can define an adapter. Adapter is something that we need to compile Svelte component because uh, as you may know, 
Svelte has a dot svelte file. So Vite and also the plugin need to know how to manage it. Okay, so here uh, we saw that we have federation config. And in the folder of the host, but uh, is the same for the remote, we have the module federation folder. Is uh, I put uh, in this folder this file, but the name uh, is up to you. And here we can see the, the host one, but uh, it's uh, the same for the remote. Here we have this federation config. The config we, we saw before with Manfred in uh, his talk. So we have the shared part of the configuration. So we need to uh, say which are the sharing library we need to share. And we are using the native federation uh, NPM package we saw before. So it's really easy and simple implement uh, uh, the configuration. And in the VIT configuration, we saw before we have a specific adapter for Svelte. And this uh, uh, Svelte plugin arrives from ESBuild Svelte plugin, this file here. So let's see what is in this file. This file here, here is only to manage the svelte.svelte file and add some imports and some other stuff. But you can take this file here and use it uh, as I read, uh, I write, I write on it. Okay. So it's only for manage.svelte file. So the configuration is really, really simple. We can go again here. This is the plugin part. We have the federation, some options, the federation configuration with the uh, library we want to share, and then the adapter. So now I can show you the build. I create a few scripts to serve and build the application. So here, if I npm run preview preview and then we preview the remote okay is building all all the stuff for us and then is serving is serving the uh, application at port uh, 4173 in the dist folder we can see that we have the import, import map that we saw before in the Manfred talk. We have the remote entry with the shared library. Here we are sharing the free solid SVG icon and something about Svelte, the RHJS also. Then if we go uh, into localhost here, I refresh. Uh, maybe I need to move this one. Okay. This is the micro front end we are creating. This is a um, media player. Okay. And as you can see, we can use uh, it uh, not only in the preview mode, but we, but we can use also the server mode. So with the hot mode reload. So if I go into the remote, into the media player file. Here we have the media player is a bunch of uh, HTML and CSS. But if we if we uh, add something in the front end and we save here, if I refresh, yeah, we can see that it's working. Okay, great. So this is our simple micro front end. The host, as we uh, saw before in the Manfred talk, in the app.svelte is loading the remote module. 
and in the main file is in it the federation stuff. So Manfred uh, before um, put this this uh, particular entry in a external file, and is it for this? This is the right uh, way to do it. We need to init the federation with the remote and the host. And then we can simply use into the app.svelte uh, file. We can load the remote. So we, we are loading the re remote media player. And then we attach the component simply uh, like a um, ref with a ref in our uh, placeholder part of the application here. So if I run npm run preview, we are previewing the remote. And in another terminal, we can npm run preview the host. Host. Okay. Host is running in 5,000. Uh, 173, so a different port. And if we open our application, we can see that here is loading the entire application. This is the entire application with our micro front ends here. So if I stop the micro front end and then I refresh the page, as you can see uh, here, we have the placeholder. This is one of the benefit of uh, micro front ends approaches. So if one micro front end fail, fail only that part of the application. So this is a cool stuff. This is the NPM package we created with uh, Manfred to use module federation on top of it. And here in my uh, GitHub, Joboa, slash React micro front end demo. We have a React implementation for a micro front end. We have a Svelte here working implementation as well. A simple one, not a, the Spotify clone. So here we are loading the host and the remote and we adapt the same things for React. So in this file here, the app.tsx, so is a React file, we are loading the remote and we are putting this uh, component inside of the page with a React suspense. So here you have two uh, proof of concept uh, if you want to play with the library and give us uh, your feedback. Okay, we can go with the uh, questions. Awesome, awesome. So thanks, Giorgio. This was really a nice showcase. It yeah. really pleases the eye, as mentioned before. Yeah, so... you, you, you said a lot of things uh, uh, in the previous talk uh, and how is simple implement your own uh, uh, way on top of a native federation. By the way, uh, Last week, uh, for uh, a customer, I implemented uh, uh, a proof of concept to load into an old Angular JS application to load a React micro front ends, and I used uh, your native federation npm package, and it's really straightforward. Awesome, awesome! That's an awesome feedback. Thanks for this. Yeah, yeah. And I used to, uh, I would like to play with the analog JS. So the um, Angular, new Angular with uh, Vit. And you created, uh, I think, something in your uh, GitHub with analog JS. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. This is a cool way to integrate. And let me say, quite standard now, nowadays, uh, way to, to do it. And if uh, it works, uh, I think uh, if it works for your context, I think it is the best feedback. Cool. Awesome. Thank you for this. Nice story. And this also brings me to the first question I have here in the chat. It's from Kevin. 
and Kevin is asking if we are locked into the framework itself. And the thing is, as George already told us, not really. No one can prevent you from loading components compiled with different frameworks into one page. Of course, it will increase the bundle size a bit, but in this case, you need to evaluate. Do you want to migrate little by little, or is it more important to have a very, very tiny bundle size? But I can tell you when it comes to enterprise scale applications, increasing the bundle size by some 100 kilobytes, some tiny amounts of megabytes is normally not an issue. If we talk about a public website, a web shop, then bundle size is king because then we talk about conversion. Yeah, I use, I use this approach uh, for migrating uh, old application in new one with the uh, strangler patterns. And uh, recently we are migrating a uh, old view two application with a uh, v uh, view three, the new version with a uh, model federation. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. yeah, I think this is how it works in the corporate environment. You cannot rewrite everything from scratch. You need to migrate little by little. Yeah. So we have a few questions. Yeah, I just looked them up. How can we put free applications on different host URIs? I tried, but got coarse. I created a node server that launches my application React View Angular. Is there a simpler method? Well, the thing is, loading different frameworks into your browser is never completely straightforward because those frameworks have not been implemented with this use case in mind. Um, that's why sometimes you need some tricks. However, on the other side, no one can prevent you from loading another bundle into your page. And if this bundle by incident bootstraps up a new application, then it will work. So yes, of course, you need to do a bit of troubleshooting, but you can make it work. It's always quite individual. Uh, that's why I don't have a general answer. And you also need to deal with this course issue. That, need, that means you need to configure your web server so that you get the right course headers. Yeah, maybe, maybe a proxy can help you to get around about this problem. So you are serving, um, if you are hitting uh, some specific endpoint, you can redirect the traffic to the other, uh, to, to the other host to get rid of the course stuff. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how can we establish communication between micro frontends? Do you have an idea, Chacha? Yeah, communication with uh, micro frontends. You can use uh, custom events. You can use the the path, the URL path. But uh, usually, we when we uh, architect a micro frontend architecture, we try to uh, be the couple one from another, one micro front ends to another to share the minimum uh, state possible. But if you need to uh, log something, you can use or uh, simply uh, save something on the local storage. You can use custom events to uh, communicate from the shell, the host, and your micro front ends. Yeah, good point. What I really like to do is I like to just share a simple object and then I use this object as an internal service bus. That's also an option. I would not use NGRX or Redux because then you have a heavyweight integration. Then you have a lot of coupling. And 
decoupling is why we are doing all of this. So make sure you don't share too much data, share as less as possible and use simple mechanisms like, as you said, events or a shared object or something like this. Yeah, yeah. because what, yeah, go, go, go what, I, what I do is um, I use like either Jotai or Recoil, which are obviously like more React oriented, but my host layer is usually React. But the idea behind it is really, it's okay, in my opinion, at least, it's okay to share state among these components as long as you're doing it the right way. So it's it shouldn't be implicit state sharing. If I remove component A, component B should still be able to fetch data that it needs, not like in Redux, if I have the menu, the menu sets up the links, and then another component depends on menu to have executed for links to exist for it to read the data out of the store. That's implicit data dependencies. What I would recommend is almost like a, a data factory. So the idea is I have something say like the mega menu Adam, and now I can call set navigation state, and I could say set a promo banner into the mega menu, and I could set you know promotional banner text or whatever. But if I wanted to say, let's say um, the mega menu gets the, the cart items or whatever, I can explicitly import the, the mega menu atom. And if I want to get any information about when the cart gets updated or changed, I have to go use recoil state mega menu item. And now I can get, you know, cart data out of it. And if cart data doesn't exist because mega menu doesn't exist, Federation will pull in the atom and it will fulfill the promise and make the API call to fetch the data and load it for me. So whoever needs it first fulfills the data. Whoever else needs it just gets the data cached already from the fulfilled promise, but it's first come first serve. So that way, almost like domain driven data, I, you know, whoever, nothing else should be on the page and I should be able to run the component and it should be able to hit whatever state machine it needs to pull the data in. Anybody else who needs the data can recycle it from a reactive data layer, but not an implicit one. So mm -hmm. I explicitly import this, I import that. And if I if anybody wants to listen on a certain channel about an update, they can, but they're not mutually exclusive. I don't need to redeploy the host to pass data or callbacks. And I don't need the other half of the remote to be there in order for my component to run. They can just share the getters on an object pull data in an efficient way and aggregate it together, but they're not mutually dependent on one existing for the other one to run. They just become more efficient when they work together, but they all are still effectively able to fulfill their own needs as needed. Hmm. Yeah, I think communicating in an implicit way is the point here. Uh, if I fail because another micro front end was not loaded, then that's, is, that is not a good situation. If I can totally live on my own, but benefit from other data that is perhaps already here, then it's fine. Yeah, yeah like the, the good example would be like, say, product data. So my product page can have a product page atom, but it could also be composed from a product data atom. And if I'm on the home page and it needs product data, and then I click on one of those things from the home page and go to the product page, they could benefit because they both use the same atom that retrieves information. And if I change something about that, like the price or the stock levels, it can remove it immediately from the pages or whatever. So I can still react to it, but it's explicit and controlled. You know who uses what and why it changes. And there's no hard dependencies. I mean, that's really it. Like, if you don't know how to do it right, then don't do it and rather only send primitive information. But if you need it, then make sure that it's designed so that it's very explicit, like everything should be able to break and it should still work because it imports directly. It doesn't use like React context or something where it may or may not exist. Cool. The next question is about unloading federated modules. Is it possible to unload something we have loaded via federation? I have an idea, but perhaps Zach, you want to answer first? Um, unloading them. So I guess the ways that I've seen it done is you could delete it off the window object and remove the script. And theoretically that will remove it. But 
there is a problem with and this is like still into modules same issue that we have with like hot reloading modules and stuff like that in node whenever you import a module the reference gets copied into the parent module that's there so just by deleting it off the window doesn't mean that whoever the parent is that imported it you could still go like mo console log module and you would see module.export module.parents module.children and those memory references would still be propagated throughout wherever it's consumed so unloading and reloading is a little tricky usually where i see individuals trying to do this is when they want to keep the same remote and swap it out with a different remote that's called the same thing halfway through usually in there i'd recommend something like a delegate module or whatever where the the name of the remote on the window is something different that way you could still import it under this alias but you could swap out the name of it and rather use a logic gate to redirect to which container do you want you know thing to come from like if you have a free and a pro tier well if the get is you know panel you could shim the little object and say oh well they're logged in with the pro account so pull from the pro remote instead of from the free remote to get the same set of modules but yeah it is tricky to unload them um in journal and like with esm i don't even it's not even possible to do this type of unloading in esm once the tree is is in memory it can't be pulled out of memory because there's no there's nothing exposed to the window scope for clearing it it's it's deep native <laughs> mm. yeah this was also the impression i had of course we can get rid of the objects we can remove it from the dome but the source code will still be in place i think i can answer the next one is ES build support for Angular planned for Angular 16, which by the way ships in half a year? And the answer is no promises. The CLI team is working on it since quite a time. If we are lucky, we might get it, but I don't know about a roadmap and there are no official promises. But yeah, let's cross fingers. I would love to see it in Angular 16. They also yeah, I think plan that's... to implement a wit like experience. Let's see. I think the big thing we always have to have to look out for with these type of things is uh, bundlers are hard. It doesn't matter how big a company you are, even at the Angular level or anything like that. The it's it's tough to replicate an ecosystem as broad as something like Angular, which does a lot of things. And switching out the bundling tool is a is a big community effort beyond just the Angular core team itself. It's collaborations and things like that um, to try and, uh, you know, cut over. So hopefully, but yeah, you know, it's just one of those things. It's, it's complicated and needs a lot of hands. <laughs> mm, yeah. And also the goal is to be completely compatible to the old way of working with Angular. And this also adds some effort. Okay, lots of compliments also for Churchill. Um, there is one question that is kind of interesting. It's about the exposed modules that start with dot slash. Why do they start with dot slash? I remember this was not always the case in module federation, but it became a usual convention. Do you have more insights here, Zach? Yes. Yeah, so the reason that we did it, we started out not doing it, and then we switched over to doing it. The reason is we wanted to conform to the same specifications as ESM and as the package JSON exports field. So if you've ever used the new stateless modules that you get from the export field where you don't put like if it's module like you don't put type module or type common js you just put package json exports and then if it uses import it goes to esm if it uses require it goes to cjs and that whole resolver step we're we're replicating that standard in node so everything starts with dot slash just like if you want to share something you put a trailing slash on the end of your package and it now makes the whole directory shareable and traverses the whole directory the same way that it does it in Node. So the reason that we use that convention is we're following the ESM standards 
for configuring this. The way I kind of see federation is it's very similar to creating a, the exports field on a package, except the package is available at runtime instead of it's something consumed at build time. And I think we'd also want to keep with that standard as, you know, when Webpack's ESM gets sorted out and with TurboPack and stuff like that, we'd probably see a transition over to, well, this syntax now fits quite nicely with whatever this looks like, say, in import maps or in some other scenario where they use similar ECMAScript, like uh, path resolvers. So that's the main reason that that we we did it like that. Um, it just and it also allows us to create like a dot, which would be the index file. So if I want to expose a micro front end and I want to use it as an index with no like exposed module, and I just want to say import app one, if I expose just dot, that'll be the index file, just like in the exports field. So yeah, and we just try to conform with the pattern. So when the native support catches up we could reapply the mechanics and make Webpack do less work and lean a bit more on native to handle some of the work. Awesome. Always a good idea. When in doubt, go with standards. Well, the next question is about a term I coined some month or years ago. It's about the Frankenstein. We all know this Frankenstein monster from the story. I think he was German. Yeah, it really happened in Germany, the story, or it was written in a fictive German uh, village. And the question is, when only using one framework, would the upside in dependency isolation be worth the problems to introduce compared to poly repo approach and the dependency version issues it presents? Well, I would say if you only have one framework and one version, I would not wrap up your components in web components because this adds an extra layer of complexity and you cannot fully uh, use the features of your framework. For instance, the Angular router can only route to Angular components and not to web components. So my short answer without knowing the whole uh, situation in your company is no, I would rather not do it if we just talk about one framework in one version. If we have several versions, of course, then wrapping stuff up in web components can help. Uh, there's a good question from Stefan, my colleague. It's about dealing with assets and translations. How to load those assets and translations? They are static files and they come from the other origin too. How can we load them without any course issues? Are there any ideas, Giorgio or Zach? Uh, usually go for, I mean, this. I think these are ESM specific issues, right? When you do like a dynamic import, it'll throw a cores issue versus like a fetch call. Or is this like a JSON file using fetch where you run into cores trying to go over the network to find the translation? Because it I depends think, on. Mm -hmm. I think it's ESM the, based because okay. otherwise cores wouldn't be that yeah. an issue uh, likely. Or yeah, not. I mean, yeah. usually. If it's local, I usually just open up my course policy to allow it. Otherwise, what I will do is like my server will run like an asset reverse proxy for me locally. Like I'll run like a little miniature worker on there or something, but I'd have like an endpoint that I could hit because I have to do this for my environment variables, which I pull out of my stage environments when I'm running locally. And so I just have a like on my configs, I've I have the ability to try catch. So if Webpack is unable to reach this origin, it can then go through the array until it finds one that's successful. So I kind of have something like that where detect what environment you're in and then pick a strategy for loading whatever you need to load. And if none of them work, then hit your own pr reverse proxy on this port and you know send it as a query parameter and it'll then retrieve the, the script content that you want or whatever back. And that way I can at least pull it all through the local machine. But yeah, cores is always a problem. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, 
Oh, there is a nice one. Do you have any tips or examples on how to achieve micro front end versioning using AWS S3? In a case where the micro front end has also lazy loaded sections. Um, so I use Medusa for this. Like I have a service called Medusa.codes. That's the URL for it. But what I do is um every build, I take an identifier from the build. So I either take the commit hash or I take the build hash or the package version. And I build everything and deploy it up to that, you know, under the S3 bucket. When I'm building it, my Medusa plugin also changes the name of the remote. So the remote is usually changed out to the hash as well. So it'll be like a commit hash. So I don't know the name of my remote entry. I just know how I'm going to refer to it. So if I want to call it header, it'll be header. And then I have a function on there that returns some hashed name and hashed script. And that can be pinned to a version. So now I can support multiple versions of the remote on the page at once or nested different versions of the remote, like a component library at four different versions, so on and so forth. But that's usually how I would do it. Part one is upload them to the bucket under a unique name that you can specify that's predictable somehow. And then part two is whatever the namespace is that you're referencing it as it has to be knowable somewhere so generally you need an api or something that you can talk to a config where you could say hey i need this from the hash map for this scenario so that it can look itself up and find it and then that that would allow you to you know basically pin them so that way you're not depending on latest all the time but you know you could have version one two and three of you know your your widget throughout your application and there won't be any collisions Cool, cool. Yeah, I have a similar approach. Um, I have a service that generates this manifest for me. And this also allows me to switch things over. However, such a service needs to be handwritten. I don't think there is a good dynamic registry out there. Uh, perhaps this would be a nice open source project, a nice uh, micro front end registry. Something NPM is doing for build time, uh, but just on runtime. Then yeah, I, I, had, uh -huh. I had I had an idea to try, at least with Federation, to, to try and build out um, the pretty much like a, a special remote that was just a re almost a proxy that just returns true to everything. So, oh, you want this version of React? It says yes to everything. And all it does is look at what someone's asking for and translate that into the unpackaged URL at whatever version's available. So that way you could just have one remote called like all of NPM. You put that on there and no matter what you need it, what you need it at, it can go and retrieve anything anywhere. And it just translates the sharing mechanisms into whatever like native system or subsystem that we want. But um, yeah, it would be nice to have a, I always say like the, the public registry is one part of it, but then that private registry is the other half, which is like your enterprise code. And I think that's usually the one where we're talking about versioning federated stuff. That's typically where all the nervousness is around is like, well, we know OSS is typically pretty good about not breaking our stuff, but engineers not working in OSS in the company might not have as, you know, strong understanding of what Simver and, you know, you really want to pin or lock it down a bit more. So yeah, I, like that's a big issue. I think with any distributed application space is the registry part for internal features or federated modules that you're putting out or remotes. That's something that, um, you know, I think anybody working with a big company should try and look into because it's just part of the maturity model. You can only use evergreen for so long and you can only manually manage for so long. And then you need some kind of, central brain that understands how things are used and where that you can coordinate like you know it's like kubernetes for docker we need kubernetes for federated code <laughs> nicely put uh the next one is also an interesting one we want to build a big front end system with more than 50 dialogues as extensions and i guess this is where federation comes in because those 50 dialogues are extensions 
Which approach is the best? Each dialogue a remote application or 10 remote applications with five dialogues each? Yeah, for me, this question is difficult to answer in general. I mean, the first question would be, do we need federation or can we just stick with one repository? Because 50 dialogues does not sound that much. However, as you say, those are extensions. They are extensions. I guess we need federation. I guess extensions mean they are developed by other people, by other teams out there and loaded at runtime. Of course, if we can just load them as NPM packages and compile them into the application, it's fine. If we really need runtime integration, then my approach for a proper cut would be something like domain-driven design, where I define things that really belong together, that things that are usually changed together. And then I would group those things into one micro frontend because having too many micro frontends is also making the life more difficult for you. You need to manage all of them. So if something strongly belongs together, I would group it to one micro frontend. This is my general answer the, here. The, the other strategy that I've done, I haven't done this often, but, and I don't know if this works with the other, with like native federation, but with Webpack, I know the one thing that I've done as well for certain use cases is I'll create almost like a monorepo, like a runtime monorepo with federation. So with module federation, you can use the plugin as many times as you want on a single build. So sometimes if you do need something where like, well, this code can all be in one repo, but what you want to do is cut out a series of remotes that can be distributed differently or have different like exposed elements in them you could always have like a build where you have five federation plugins on there and they each stamp out a slightly different remote name or you know do something a little different and share a few things different and that could help you like you know split the application up in a variety of ways but generally if we have say like 50 of them the thing i would try and watch out for is not having to download lots of remote entries that have to turn around and download lots of other files. Like having it one for one is already a little tricky. And if you're, if you can group them, it would be a good idea. And also, how large is it? Like, could you could you expose an index file that had several exports in there? So you're loading maybe, you know, like if the file you're exposing, like let's say it's one kilobyte, I would rather expose ten, uh, ten kilobyte files than 101 kilobyte files because of the network. So mm. I would also look at your chunk aggregation where that makes sense. So domain driven, um, the, the, the splitting strategy that you want and what's the compression to unused code offload that you're getting. Is it, it generally, I find like, I'd rather join some of the chunks together and say, I'll let the user download in batches of 15 kilobytes because that's acceptable. Even if they just wanted one icon, maybe they get another five icons included in that exposed module because it's cheap enough and it still has good compression and I'm not hammering the network with lots of things. So org organizational constraints and then bandwidth constraints would be the two things that I factor into how you split them up. Awesome. The next one is something I can answer. It's about unloading Angular modules. Can they be unloaded? So the first answer, the easy answer is no. The second, not that easy answer is you cannot unload the loaded source code, but you can destroy them in memory if you instantiate them by hand. If you instantiate them by hand, you can destroy them. However, uh, instantiating ng modules by hand is nothing you want to do. It's it's done by the router uh, underneath the covers, but it's nothing you want to do. So uh, yeah, I, I I would keep hands off it. Debugging techniques for implementing something like module federation. 
Which debugging techniques do you use, Giorgio and Zach? Just for keeping console log is an option. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say console log is like my go-to. Um, also the step through debugger from time to time. I mostly use that on the node side to understand how my chunks are getting interpreted um, and things like that. But I would say another good debug step, it depends if you're debugging locally or wherever, but another useful one is to mess around with your share scope so that your production apps, when you're running parts of them locally, you can replace like something like the React DOM with the development version or other way around. If I'm in production, I can usually issue a special override sequence to tell production switch over to React development mode in production just for my user. And now I can use the development tools in production and test out what's going on if I need to like look at something. So that's usually like the kind of things that I'd suggest. My main use case normally is um, console logging stuff or um, putting an ES proxy around the Federation object with a custom promise so that I could see what's it asking for from ShareScope, who's giving it, and just being able to debug like who's sharing what and where so I can try to find if something isn't shared correctly or if it's coming from a wrong host that I don't want it to. But yeah, main thing is, is console logging, honestly. <laughs> it's probably the number one. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm happy to be not alone with this, especially when it comes to bundling tools and plugins it's sometimes a bit difficult to hook in the node debugger. Of course, it helps the node debugger, but sometimes it's just easier to console lock something out. But don't tell anyone. <laughs> yeah, and maybe you can create a, a function in your host to centralize all the errors and send them to a server like a Sentry to get uh, um, a feedback from your application in production and get uh, some, some read the errors on that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. This is then for the deployed application, isn't it? Not for the dual micro uh, module federation itself, but uh, for the deployed yeah. application. Yeah. 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 Dis distributed logs, I would say, is a really big one. Um, I know the Century team's working on improving micro front end implementation, but I wrote an article a little while back that gave like an example on how to do it with Sentry Hub. But that's a big one is like, I think uh, with any of this stuff, if you're going distributed, you don't want to lose observability. And it becomes more important in distributed systems because now things can change in ways that you don't know when, why, or how they changed. So you need to be able to see what changed and how did it have an impact. And so a big one is you know, decentralized logging where the the user, the one who owns the component gets the logs about the component's problems, not the one consuming it. Because if my team, if I import my navigation and it breaks my application, I have no power to fix it. I don't want to be paged at 2 a.m. I want, if the nav breaks anything, I want the team that owns the nav to get paged with the detail saying, this is the host it didn't work on. This is the, what happened. This is where it happened. And then they can get up and just redeploy the nav and it automatically fixes the application that broke. So that was also a really big one is to ensure that you've got good observability and telemetry in place so that when something breaks, you know who, where, and who needs to be paged because of it, not who's consuming it and wake up the consumer who might not be able to do anything to fix it. Cool. Uh, it's about security. How to share security tokens in a micro front end environment? Well, my answer would be passing a token to another application is always a bit risky because if the other application just takes a token from you, it might also take a token from an attacker. And then you might work in a different context and send your sensitive data to some other backend or to some other user accounts. The best thing you could do is to always get the token from your authorization server, like Keycloak, 
because in this case you use protocols like OAuth 2 and they make sure that such attacks don't work. Plus, what I'm doing lately is um, I have a proxy server that takes care of handling the tokens. And so the proxy server can exchange the token for different domains. That means I don't have a master key token that unlocks each and every domain. I just exchange my tiny token for a token that just unlocks the business domain in the backend I need to work with. And yeah, as everything stays on the server side, it's con considered to be a bit more safer, a bit considered to be safer. Even the O of two working group, meanwhile, tells us, please don't use O of two in the browser, if somehow possible, terminate the flow on your server side, because the server uh, is more capable of storing secrets like access tokens. This one is an interesting one. How bad are iframes? What would you say, Giorgio and? Uh, well, uh, iframes uh, are um, a standard. Let me say, uh, they have their own problem. But with the module federation, I think you can do better than a, an iframe. Maybe you, if you need to include some uh, old stuff or maybe some other uh, software or some other uh, application in your uh, environment, in your application, iframe can, can be a solution. But I think it's not the best solution for uh, micro front ends architecture. Yeah, same here, same here. We can do better nowadays with something like module federation, as you say, for legacy stuff, yeah, it's valid. And another point I figured out where iframes are used is when you need a very strict isolation. Uh, think about implementing a, a plug-in system for a car, and think about everyone on this globe is capable of implementing plugins. Then you need to isolate those plugins. You need to make sure that one plugin is not hacking the car or other plugins. I've also seen this in the area of gambling. You know, when we have an online casino, uh, most of the times those companies are in Malta. And so those um those workshops are always quite fun because malta is always a nice place to be uh if you have an online casino then you very likely will buy or rent this or that casino games from this or that vendor and those games need to be integrated in your casino website but they need to be isolated so that they don't hack your casino or not influence other casino games and yeah also their iframes are quite common. So isolation and legacy, but as you say, in general, we can do better with yeah, module. I think this is a great uh, example about using iframe to isolate stuff. Yeah. Cool. There is a question for Zach. I think Zach already left. For some reason, he dropped out. I don't know why. And it seems like he's not in the waiting room either. The question is about if he will move to Turboback or stick with Webback. Perhaps he can answer this question on Twitter. Reach out to him, Stefan. I'm sure he will answer you on Twitter. Yeah, I tried the uh, Turbopack because I, I'm curious, like every other developer. And honestly now it's in beta it's really fragile if you tune up with the configuration uh, uh, it will be broke you can broke it uh, really easily so i think it's uh, it's not uh, the era of turbo pack maybe when they re will release the version one we can think about it Mm, yeah, I think it's promising, but as we see, say here in Austria, 
some additional water needs to go down the river until it's ready for prime time. So, yeah. There is a good point. Um, we usually don't even send O of two access tokens to the browser, but just emit an HTTP only session cookie by the gateway, which is replaced with the access token when forwarding requests. Yeah, totally. This is the current proposal of the O of two working group. Don't send access tokens to the browser, at least not if it is a sensitive environment because the browser cannot protect your access tokens. However, the browser can protect HTTP only cookies. And there is a thing called same site cookie that even protects from more attacks. And so, yeah, this is the recommended approach. Just send down an HTTP only cookie, a same site cookie, and exchange this cookie in the backend in your gateway. And this means that the access token can stick in the backend. And as I mentioned before, in this gateway, you can exchange one access token by another one. That means you don't have a master key. You know, if you run around with the master key and the master key is stolen, you have quite an issue. Instead, you exchange your key for another key that just unlocks this or that domain. Okay, awesome. I would say ding, 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 last call, like in the English pub. Are there any remaining questions? Awesome. So in this case, thanks for joining. It was really a pleasure to have my two friends here, Giorgio and Zach. It was a pleasure to talk with you and also to see your showcases. And yeah, stay tuned and see you next time. Bye bye. A pleasure to be here. If you find you can find me on Twitter, my handle is Giorgio underscore Boa. So if you want to contact connect with me, really it was a, it will be a pleasure. A pleasure. Awesome. Thanks. Connect with this guy. Very recommended. See you around. Bye. 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 So let me stop recording. Yeah. Oh, for some.